Oh, man, it's so good to be here this week. I wasn't able to be with you last week. I, uh, I regret that, but there was nothing I could do about it. Um, but I get to celebrate Easter Sunday with you guys today, and, and I'm looking forward to what God's going to do in this room and in the lives and in the hearts of everyone who opens it, who opens our life. When we open our life to God and just say, God, I, I, just, I just ask you, just do something, do something strange, do something weird, do something that takes me off guard, because I don't know if you've been a Christian for a long time, or maybe you've never accepted Christ into your heart, uh, just, just make yourself a promise. Just say, God, if you want me to hear something, I, I need, I need an, I need I need an, uh, a, 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 an alert from you. And, and, and if we can be attentive to what God is going to do in our life, man, uh, imagine the things. Uh, I'm excited to see the things that God is going to be doing in our life as we celebrate the resurrection today. Sound good? Are you guys with me? Well, we're going to be in Luke chapter 24 today, and we're going to be talking about Easter Sunday, believe it or not. All right, Luke chapter 24, we're going to be talking about Easter Sunday, and just to set the stage a little bit, um, Jesus has already been raised from the dead. Um, it's Easter Sunday morning, and some of his disciples have already discovered an empty tomb. And we're going to follow a, uh, we're going to read a good portion of scripture here. I'm going to be reading out of the, NI, or the NLT translation. So if your Bible looks a little bit different, but the words are going to be up on the screen. But if you want to join me in this, um, I, I think God has some really important stuff for us to hear today as we encounter a story of people who encountered the empty tomb. Are you guys ready? So Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35 says this. And that same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short. Sadness written across their face. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened the last few days. What things, Jesus asked? The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles. And he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucify him. We had hoped he was the Messiah. The one who had come to rescue Israel. And this all happened three days ago. Then some of our women got up from our group and of his followers and went to his tomb early this morning. And they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing. And they had seen an angel who had told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and just and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you find it hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in Scripture. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all of the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. And Jesus acted as if he was going to go on, but they begged him, stay the night with us since it is getting late. So he went to the home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took bread and blessed it, and he broke it and gave it to them. And suddenly... Their eyes were open and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn when he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within, our, and within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. They had found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered who said, the Lord has appeared to Peter. And the two men from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus appeared to them. Can we just take a moment and pray over that scripture real quick? Dear God, I just pray that right now in these next few moments, you would open our eyes 
just like these two men who walked on the road to Emmaus, that you would open our eyes and and have us recognize and realize something about you, about your character, about your love, about your sacrifice, about your mercy and grace, dear God, that we have never realized before. Be in this room, in in our presence. We invite you here this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever felt alone? Have you ever felt um, uh, just kind of forgotten, unsure of what's going on? And that's, that's where we pick up this story with these two men who were walking seven miles from Jerusalem. They were walking and they were, they were distraught. They were sad. They had a lot of things going on. They had a lot of emotions happening. You ever had, just had a lot of emotions going on? And they got seven miles to walk. I don't know if you've walked seven miles recently in one stretch, but it's a lot of time that you get to reminisce and kind of bring things up. And when there's something heavy on your mind for seven miles of walking, you end up marinating in it a little bit. They were marinating their minds in disappointment. And the thing about a good marinade is it's potent enough to penetrate whatever you're putting in it. It's great for chicken because it's bland. But man, when that marinade is potent and it's this disappointment that you're, that you're living in, it can, be, it can be a danger to your mind. It allows us to, to just soak in what we're saying, what we're thinking, how we're feeling, the emotions of the moment. And that's where we pick up these two men who had, who had endured everything through the cross, who had endured everything with Jesus. This was the Messiah. And now, over the last three days, everything that they had hoped for had come to an end. You see, what they, can, they concluded something, and, and I think there's something here that we can learn, and it's true for us, that what we conclude is more important than what we experience. Right? What we conclude is more important than what we experience. That doesn't mean the experience didn't happen or the experience isn't important, but it's what we tell ourselves about what we went through. The conclusion is more powerful than the event to us. Why? Because it's what we expel. It's what we're going through. It's It's how we read the situation. We expel what is important through what we endure. Our perception is one that carries more weight than the actual thing that happened. Why? Because we act upon our conclusions. The conclusions we reach about the things that happen to us, the stories that we tell ourselves, that's what we act upon, right? That's what these men were doing. See, what you face is more important than what you, or what you face isn't as important as what you think about what you faced. You see, when sadness, hurt, and sorrow of this world overwhelm us, what we conclude sets up what we do, how we act, the actions that we take in those moments. These two men were marinating in the sadness of their crushed expectations of who the Messiah was. They concluded that the death of Jesus was the end of everything that they had hoped for. They even said that, that we had hoped for. They started talking about Jesus in the past tense because why? He was dead. They were there. They were there through it. They probably watched it. They were followers of who Jesus was. They were followers of Jesus, had hoped he was the Messiah, and they had went through the crucifixion and were there up until Easter morning. They had hoped that he was going to rescue Israel. And everything that they believed was turned on its head in those three days. When he was Taken through the trial, he was dead, buried in a silent Saturday. And even Easter Sunday morning, everything had changed for them. So what did they do? They left Jerusalem. They got out of Dodge. They were like, listen, we're not not here for this. Everything changed. Our, Our world is crashing down. And they were just reminiscing about their emotions as they walked through. But notice the questions that Jesus asked. What are you discussing as you walk? What things are you talking about? What are the things that you're discussing? What are the things that are making you so sad? And we can see it on your face. I mean, Jesus knew what they were discussing. Like, it happened to him, right? It wasn't like it was like, who is this guy? See, Jesus wasn't afraid of their conclusions. He he was offering a peace in the midst of the panic. He was offering Christ in the midst of the chaos that Jesus wasn't afraid of their conclusions, Isn't that good news today that Christ isn't afraid of our conclusions? The things that we think that we've went through, the things that we have went through, the conclusions that we've drawn about them, 
and our crushed life expectations that Christ is not, is not disappointed in our decisions, is not disappointed in, in the conclusions that we reached. He's not afraid of our fears, of our family, of our finances. He's not, he's not afraid of any of that stuff. He welcomes it. He asks us. He doesn't discount us because of our doubt or our disbelief. He encourages it. He asks them the question. He asks them those questions to get them to wrestle with and to deal with the things that are actually going on in their life. Even when they were doubting. And you know how we know this, that Jesus isn't afraid of our conclusions? It's because these guys had the wrong conclusions, yet they were, Jesus was still right beside them walking with them. He still showed up out of nowhere, spooky a little bit, you know, just this guy shows up out of nowhere, starts walking along with you, and he's like, hey, what are you guys talking about? Let's talk about it. And he's asking the question to draw out the fears and the emotions of these two men as they walked along. His presence brings peace. His presence brings peace. He was walking with the wounded. He wasn't afraid of the ministry of presence to be present with the people who were hurting, the people who were going through stuff, the people who had had an emotional roller coaster the last weekend. He promised to never lead us nor forsake us. And here in this moment, we get a perfect example, a perfect picture of the person of Jesus Christ. That no matter the conclusions that we reach, he walks with us. Despite the difficult circumstance, he walks with us. Even when we're wrong, he walks with us. Even when we've reached the wrong conclusion, he's walked with us. Even when we, when we don't have all the blanks to fill in, even when we think we don't even have blanks in our life, he's walking with us, offering the peace of his presence. Even when we don't have the right information, See, these two followers understood a few things about the Messiah and what he was supposed to do. They were well learned in the, in, the, in the scriptures of what was supposed to take place, what this Messiah was supposed to look like. And they saw it in Jesus and they said, that's going to be him. And when he died on the cross, they were like, everything, everything is different now. Everything was crushed. They thought that they were working with all of the information. I mean, they, they stayed until Easter morning. Well, anybody wake up this Easter morning? Raise your hand. Come on. Give me something. Raise your hand. Yeah, most of you are here. I know some of you are like, oh my goodness. Uh, I wore my best for this and that collar's getting weird or, or anything like that. But, but, but they were there Easter morning. I want you to think about this. This is one of those things that I never even recognized until I really started to study this passage. They were there Easter morning. They got up. They had to... They had to bury Jesus on Friday in a hurry because Sabbath was coming. They couldn't do anything. And this group of believers had gotten together. And imagine the sadness that was going on in that room. Imagine the sadness that was going on amongst the believers. They were marinating in this entire weekend. And early Sunday morning, they get up. Some of the women go to the tomb. And they're getting, they're getting everything ready, and they come back, and they say, S- stuff happened. He's gone. And the men go to check it out, and they're like, yep, they're right. The body's gone. And these two men, they're like, we've heard enough. We were there already. They were working with the information. They said, you know what? Someone has taken the body. They heard the, the first person account. Someone's taken the body is the conclusion that they drew. That was the assumption. Why? I mean, it wasn't a wrong assumption. I mean, think about this. This is, this is a side note. I was going to preach this last week, but I didn't. Um, but th- this is a side note. This is actually one of the things that, that uh, a lot of scholars believe. This is the reason that Pilate allowed Joseph of Arimathea to bury Jesus. See, Jesus was crucified as a criminal. And most of the time what would happen at that point is they would just leave the bodies up there all weekend, right? Leave the bodies up there as a warning to anybody else because this was a rival king to Pilate. And now this man, Joseph of Arimathea, shows up, not related to Jesus, and he says, can I bury Jesus in my tomb? And Pilate said, you know what? Yes, because there's probably some fanatics out there who are going to try to steal the body, and if we take it down, if they'll, they'll take it down over, over Sabbath, and, and they'll just claim that he, was, that he rose from the dead, or if we bury it out in the, in the, in the end of the village, it would be easy to say it, so let's, let's keep it in a tomb. 
And let's roll a stone in front of it. And let's put a guard in front of it. That way we know exactly where his body is. They knew this. And they were like, listen, somebody stole the body. We don't want to be anywhere in the area when Pilate comes looking for the people. We don't want to be anywhere. So they got out of Dodge. They, they left. They had come to a conclusion. And you know what? It, it really honestly wasn't that bad of a conclusion. Can we be honest here? It really wasn't that bad of a conclusion. Have you, have you ever watched somebody who came to a conclusion and you kind of just had to chuckle because of how they got to that conclusion? Right? It reminds me of the story of the third grader who was in biology class. And they were dissecting a grasshopper. And, and they, they put the grasshopper there, and, and the, boy, the boy looks at the grasshopper, and he says, hop. And the grasshopper just jumps up and trying to get away. And the boy grabs the grasshopper, and he pulls a leg off and says, hop. And the grasshopper hops, and, and then he pulls another leg off, and the grasshopper hops and pulls the third leg off, and the grasshopper doesn't hop anymore. And the teacher said, what did we learn? And the boy said, after three legs, the ha- grasshopper turns deaf. We chuckle because we're like, ah, I see how you got to the conclusion that you got to. And these two men, they saw how they got to the conclusion. Jesus was sitting there with them, walking with them, and he saw how they got. Dead people don't rise. This wasn't what was planned. It's funny because even though you know how you got there, you can't help appreciate to how they arrived there. But in that moment, all of their hope died with them in their conclusion, which based upon their actions. You see, Jesus' response to their conclusion was to explain, you foolish people. And he he was using foolish in, in the way that scripturally it was meant. One who does not allow the scriptures to influence their thinking and behavior. How could this suffering be a part of the plan? Everything was supposed to be great. My life was supposed to be good. This is what they were thinking. Yet he, they had overlooked the prophecies about the negative things and started looking at the prophecies, uh, only the prophecies that were benefiting them, only the prophecies that were glorifying them. I think it's easy for us today to get caught up in our life where, where it's easy to follow Jesus. Sometimes churches or even uh, our devotionals or our YouTube videos that we're following, we get caught up in this. We we come up with sermons like 10 ways to be a better, Jesus can help you be a better parent. Or like three ways that um, Jesus can be a better spouse. Or like, you know, here's seven ways if you listen to Christian music, you'll have abs by the end of summer. You know, like we we just kind of talk about Jesus as this miracle pill to where if you, you, you add a little bit of this to your life, your life's going to be better. But here's some news that Jesus wanted to share with them and Jesus wants to share with us today. Jesus didn't come, Jesus didn't die on the cross to make your life better, he came to save your soul. He didn't come to make our life better, he came to save our soul. Fortunately, we're blessed that life is a lot better with a saved soul. This is what Jesus wanted those people to know, that his death restores hope. His death wasn't just for your life to be better, it restored a hope within them. And then it says Jesus took them through the scriptures. These two awesome uh, disciples, man, they got a front row seat into Old Testament Christology with Jesus Christ. And he, he opened scriptures and he talked to them, not just about the good things, not just about the glorification, but about the suffering that the Messiah would have to do. And he began to restore their hope. He comforted them with his peace of presence. And now he started to restore their hope because he was patient with them through that process, the process of unbelief the process of doubt, the process of understanding. Jesus was patient with them. Got a master class in watching the master bring peace and hope to those who desperately needed it. And a promise of his redemption that was not bound by a grave, that couldn't be stopped by the grave. That's not the end of the story, though. That's not the end of where these two men had this moment. They started to recognize and realize that it wasn't about their personal preference. It wasn't about what they thought. Jesus was opening their mind to something more, a hope that couldn't be explained, a hope that couldn't be pinpointed. That God's plan was more than just what they could see. Jesus started to paint a fuller picture of his plan to save 
humanity. To restore the relationship that was broken during the fall. And once they understood it, once they understood it, their hope started to become restored. This is what could happen. This is what could be there. The interesting part is, they started to realize that once that hope could be restored, there was something that happened when Jesus died, that a curtain that had separated humanity from from the creator was ripped in half from top to bottom, saying, listen, you're no longer bound by the rules um, because I have paid the price. I have paid the penalty for your sins. They got started to get excited. They still didn't understand everything, but they started to get excited and their hope was restored. But this was just the beginning. Their hope was restored in the person of Jesus Christ because they no longer had some of the doubts. They still had some doubt, but they didn't have some of the other doubts. They didn't know exactly what he was doing, but they knew a little bit more about what he was doing. They saw things, and to reach a different conclusion, God opened it, Jesus opened up the word to them and started explaining things different to them. And they were like, wow, this is good. You heard it earlier in the scripture. Their hearts burned inside them with excitement that, wow, the, I can feel it. I can feel God's maybe starting to do something new. I might not understand it all yet, but there was something that was missing, and that was the personal encounter. Remember, at this point, they didn't know who Jesus was. They didn't know who was walking with them. You ever not known who was walking with you? They had no clue. And scholars go back and forth whether, whether G, you know, God actually disguised them or maybe just they weren't, they weren't looking for him. But it says this in verse 28. By this time they had reached Emmaus. They were almost to the end of their journey. And Jesus gets an Emmy for his acting ability. He's like, you know, I'm just going to keep going a little further, right? I'm just going to keep on going. I'm going to stay the night. But they begged him, stay the night with us. Join us. Come come in and sup with us. Come in and eat with us. Come in and, and, and live with us. I'm inviting you into our space. Isn't that just like Jesus? Walks along, giving hope and peace, but never barges in never barges in. He just he, he wants you to know a little bit about him, but he always is waiting for the invitation. And just like his word promises that once he was invited in, they got way more than they were asking for. They got way more than they were asking for. Jesus' method of bringing spiritual illumination had always been to explain the meaning of what God revealed. And Jesus didn't force his way into their life. He offered peace and hope, and the decision was up to them. And it was in this moment that they began to know the difference between a heart knowledge and head knowledge. They had some of the head knowledge. Jesus had opened up the word and said, here's some of the stuff that I've got going on. Here's some of the stuff that I want you to know. They still didn't know him. They still didn't know him until he sat down with them. They invited him in. He sat down with them. and He broke bread with them. It was a moment of true true relationship. He broke bread with them, and what happened? Immediately they recognized who he was. Immediately they recognized who he was, and it was at that moment that he disappeared. Now, we can go all day about all these things, but here's where I think the fun, the fun, exciting word that that God revealed to us is. See, in John 16, Jesus was talking with his followers before he died. Jesus was talking with his followers, telling them what was going to happen. It's like, hey, listen, I'm going to die. You're going to not see me anymore again. Your sorrow is going to be great. So you have sorrow. And in 22, he, uh, 16, verse 22, he says this. So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Then you will rejoice, and no one can rob you of that joy. You see, joy is incomplete until it is expressed. Joy is incomplete until it is expressed. It gives us purpose to change the way that we think, to change the way that we act. It's not something that we have done. What were those two men doing on the road to Emmaus? 
They were getting out of the way. Everything had changed, and they said, we're going on. We are going away from this place. Everything that Jesus did was pointing to Jerusalem, was pointing to the cross. And here you have, after the death, when doubt starts to set in, these two men say, you know what? We're going away from everything Jesus pointed towards because we don't understand it. And Jesus restores their peace. Jesus restores their hope. But until they had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, that personal encounter gave them the power to joyfully embrace what they had once wanted to escape. What they were fleeing from, what they were leaving from, what they were running away from, God gave them the power to the power of the joy of the Holy Spirit to go back and embrace the things they, they were trying to get away from. It says it right there in verse 33. It says, within the hour, after they recognized it was Jesus in their life, within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. Within the hour. Now, they weren't even to Emmaus yet. They had just stopped because this is getting dangerous and this is getting a little dark. And they were like, we don't want to stub our toe. We're just going to pull over here. We're going we're gonna to stop right here. Hey, Jesus, come join us. They didn't know it was Jesus. But hey, Jesus, come join us. We're going to do some stuff. But we're just going to be safe right now. And the second that they realized, within the hour that they realized the person of Jesus Christ and they had the personal encounter and accepted him into their life and invited him into their life, what did they do? They ran back. They ran back screaming and telling, hey, here's the person of Jesus in my life. Here's what Jesus did for me. He's given me the power to embrace the things that I tried to escape. He's given me peace that I can't, I can't say. He's given, restored my hope, and he's given me the power of joy and purpose in my life. You see, fear made them flee, but joy set them free. It's what was going on inside that gave them a purpose for why they were to be who they were to be. And that curtain separating just opened up the entire world to the presence of Jesus Christ that we could live in that because there was nothing that we could do. There was nothing that we could earn our way in. There was nothing that we could do. It was all up to him. And that's what he did. And his, his resurrection brought hope that we could live in the joy of the person of Jesus Christ. And the, the circumstances that we live in, he paints the fuller picture. His presence gives us that peace. The, 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 the death gave us the hope. But the resurrection gives us a purpose for the future. Now, I don't know where you guys are right now, but that's good news to me. Because I am chiefly not worthy of what he did in my life. I have no room to stand up here and be preaching to you about anything because I am the chief of sinners. I'm the person who, who could not have earned anything that God set out for me. It was the, his mercy and grace alone. It wasn't about anything that I could do. It was about him. And in this Easter at the cross, that's where we saw it. That's where we saw hope restored. But today, we all have that opportunity, just like the two guys on the road to Emmaus, to say, hey, I'm going to give you, God, a personal invite into my life. Come eat with me. Come sup with me. Come live with me. As I thank you for everything that I couldn't do for myself, you're the one who paid the price. You're the one whose mercy is great. You're the one who's awesome. God, I don't want to see it about the things that aren't good for me. And when my life isn't good, here, God, I don't want to, I don't want to treat you like a magic pill that I can take and just a, a little bit more of Jesus is going to help me out today. Amen? It's that personal invitation. And when, that, when Jesus Christ became personal, that's when their life changed. When, when they had an encounter with the resurrected Lord and Jesus Christ, that's when their life changed. That's when they were set free. So I'm going to go ahead and have the band come on back up, and we're going to worship a little bit this evening, or this evening. I'm Good Friday still. Good Friday, I was saying good morning, now I'm saying good evening. But I don't want you to miss this potential opportunity that God might be speaking to you, just like he did on the road to Emmaus to these two men, giving you the peace of his presence and giving you the hope of his resurrection but missing out on the person of Jesus Christ, the resurrected Lord, who is king of all. It's what, it's what makes today good. It's why we can celebrate Good Friday, because it's not about our circumstances. It's about the hope that he offers. It's about the hope that we're drawn to. 
So today, here's what I'm going to ask. We've got, we've got an awesome prayer team that's, that's up here. They're not going to come forward yet, um, but they're going to make themselves available towards the end of the service. But we even have some altars over on the sides. And if, and if today you've made a decision or you're thinking about making a decision and say, hey, you know what, I, 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 I want to I hear a little bit more about that peace and the hope that you were talking about. I'm going through a whole bunch right now. I'm going through a whole lot of things in my life where the circumstances aren't good for me. And I want, to, I want to know about this person of Jesus Christ that you talk about. Today's for you. Maybe you've been living, maybe you've been living in some peace, but, but you're really looking forward to some hope that's going to be out there. You're really looking for something to just hold on to a little bit longer because the conclusions that you've been reaching have been sending you in the wrong direction away from who Jesus is. Today, Jesus has got hope for you. And it's whenever we accept all of that and we have the interaction today, like many of us in this room are having, where we have an interaction with the person of Jesus Christ, and we're sitting down and breaking bread, and, it, and he becomes real to us, we have the opportunity to accept him into our lives, invite him into our lives. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray a, a short prayer. I'm going to pray a short prayer, and some people call it the sinner's prayer, and, and some people just say it's a prayer, and some people don't know what it is. It doesn't even have a name. But I'm going to pray a short prayer for us today. And Scott, would you just play a little something in the background? I know I told you don't do that earlier, and I changed my mind. But today, I just want to take a moment, and on this Easter Sunday, we have the opportunity to encounter the person of Jesus Christ, the resurrected Lord not just a theory about them, not just something that's talked about. And I believe just like these two men, some of us in here are having the same emotions that these two men in Emmaus had. Your hearts have been burning. You feel something you can't describe. You feel just like they did. Uh, didn't our hearts burn within us? And you've got an opportunity got an opportunity to invite Jesus in before he passes, before he goes on a little bit. And that invitation could set you free, freer than you ever thought you could be. So I'm going to pray this prayer. And as you bow your heads and close your eyes, some of you guys have prayed this prayer many a times, and some of you guys need to rededicate your life, and some of you guys have never prayed this prayer. But in your heart, in your mind, you're more than welcome to move to the altars if you want. You're more than welcome to sit right there. But I just want you to pray these prayers silently, out loud if you want, as I pray this. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've done wrong. And today I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins. And just like we're celebrating today that you rose from the dead. Today I want to turn from my sins and embrace the peace and the hope that you have for my life. To embrace the freedom that you have, dear God. God, come into my heart. Come into my life. I want to make you Lord of my life. I want to trust you, and I want to follow you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. If anybody just prayed that prayer to accept Jesus in your heart, just raise your hand real quick. I see that. I see that. Oh, my goodness. For those of you who raised your hands and for those of you who didn't, but you prayed that prayer and you invited Jesus Christ into your life today, this is the celebration that Easter is all about. Because we get to know a God who isn't just a theory, who isn't just something that's out there, who doesn't just make us feel peaceful or make us feel hope. He is those things. He is those things. And we get to celebrate him today. I'm going to go ahead and invite you to stand as we get ready to celebrate with a song. And if today, at the end of the service, I'm going to be back up here to close. At the end of the service, if you want to talk to somebody about something that you're going through, about something that you need to go through, 
something that is going to be difficult in your life, our altars are open and our prayer team is going to be up here. But right now, we're going to just take a moment and celebrate the goodness of who God is. Let's worship.